And in fact, I suggest that death is shaping our entire biotic world, everything that we see. And I'll start here with the discovery in the current, uh, in the 20th century, of programmed cell death. And they described in the late 1970s, sitting at the microscope and watching a cell die and recognizing that it was dying under genetic control. It wasn't accidentally dying. It was dying for developmental reasons. Think about a duck's foot. You have it mentally? Now think about a chicken's foot. Think about a tree leaf. It could be a deciduous, right, like our big leaf maple here, or it could be a coniferous tree. <laughs> How does that shape happen? How does that shape happen? It happens because of programs. As we develop, as organisms develop, tetrapods like our cells, vertebrates, our limbs develop, and they go through a process, and in fact you get a series of digits forming. But in some cases, the genetic program that controls our development doesn't operate as what we call normally, and you end up with incomplete separation, a webbing between the toes. There's all kinds of things. Here it is in the fingers, where the fingers fail to separate. Program cell death operates to destroy and kill those cells between those digits for normal formation. But it's not just a matter of the cells in our hands. This extends to many different types of things. It's sculpting of the animal digits. It's sculpting of the tree and the outside. It's the formation of bark. It's the formation of your skin. What that means to an ecologist is that when I look out at a landscape, I cannot see that landscape except for death. Physical death is operating there. And it's, I'm not talking about the leaves falling in the, you know, you've got to rake up in the fall. The very formation of the trees, everything about everything that you see. And that is the implication, and uh, as I say, I think the necessity for death. Biotic death, it appears to me, was present from the beginning. You see it in Genesis, even though it isn't being talked about. Are fruitfulness and death twins in creation? Is there any way to conceive of be fruitful and multiply? You can't get through one day unless you consume something. If Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, would they still have died of old age? Or would they just have continued living? Well, it's, it's complete speculation. And, and there's two parts to that answer, is that who do you think Adam and Eve were? Um, and so now I'm saying you're formulating that question as Adam and Eve were individuals. Um, and there's a, there's a number of different theologians that are simply saying that, that that's probably the wrong way to think about what that story is telling us. But now let's go inside of the story as we've received it as two individuals. There's a tree of life and a tree of knowledge of good and evil. <coughs> they take from one, and God says we must stop them from the other. And he, he acts to stop them from the other. That suggests to, I've read from many theologians, that in fact, if they hadn't, they would have died. If they hadn't taken from the tree of life, then certainly eternal life would not have been available, and that would suggest that biotic death would have come to them. And it's quite remarkable what's happened over the last 40 years. And so N.T. Wright, if you know that, that name, is a theologian who is just very clear on this. Richard Middleton that I cited here, and there are many others. And they're looking back at this, and we have read into that text a particular understanding. And it's very much an Enlightenment understanding. Now you go to the historians, and you go to the medieval period, and it turns out 
They didn't see death the way we see death. It wasn't it, it, the problems that are our problems are not theirs. If you go to the Old Testament, it turns out that the discussion about Adam ends in Genesis 3. It doesn't show up again. Some of the wisest things I heard from a colleague in the American Scientific Affiliation, Walt Hearn, when I was starting graduate school, talking about evolution and questions, and he said to me, John, when you're talking with your students, Give them time to go on the journey that you've gone on. I did not come to this place immediately. I spent a lot of time with a lot of careful men and women thinking carefully about this before. And I do think we need in the church as a whole to give one another some grace and some room. And it, especially today, we're in a highly polarized a kind of my way or the highway is the, uh, it seems to be the approach sometimes, and I think we just need to be a lot more careful about that.